the art of meditation. The art of meditation. It is a demanding task and it is the finest line of the Christian life. Um, to produce strong wine, I've never been a winemaker, but I'm sure if you were to ask an individual who produces wine or owns a vineyard, I assume that it would be hard work to do that. But that's how the only way that we're going to turn our knowledge of God into knowledge of God, from knowledge about God into knowledge of God. Many people know about God, but meditation is how we turn our knowledge into practical application. It is an activity as well as a spiritual discipline of calling of mind and thinking over things and God told Ezekiel to eat the scroll, meditating upon the truth of God's word, dwelling upon the Lord, setting the Lord continually before us, the psalmist said, to what end? To discover the various things that we know about God, His promises, His purposes, and it's really thinking of holy thoughts. Now, I know this is an exciting introduction. If I were to stand up here and throw an Oreo against the wall, I'm sure it would have everybody's attention. It's thinking holy thoughts. It's consciously uh, performed in the presence of God, under the eye of God. Meditation can only be performed by the help of God. To what end? To have communion with God. It's something that Bible College cannot teach. It's something that Joe Miller tapes cannot teach. It's something that the great school of Josh Yance's mentorship school cannot teach Alex. It's something that memorizing Greek cannot teach or politics cannot teach. We talk about politics all the time. We talk about the weather or the Peekneyville Panthers great basketball team. But very rarely will you ever hear a Christian talk about meditating on the Word of God. So, sister, how has God's Word been speaking to you this week? Blank stare. Now, I don't mean to be critical. But I am being analytical. I think that the effect of meditation is to humble us, to contemplate our smallness in light of the magnanimous glory of God. David said in Psalms, but I am a worm in light of the holiness of God. I think the point of meditation, Psalms 8 1, is. How majestic is your name, O oh God, to contemplate our sinfulness, to contemplate His glory, to encourage us and to strengthen us, meditation, to contemplate His divine mercy that's been displayed to every one of us through the Lord Jesus Christ and in and through. But I think the final reason to meditate on the Lord is the trajectory or the bullseye is to think about how much do we really love the Lord? How often do we tell the Lord, I love you? That's the text before us this morning. Compelling the beloved. The knowledge of God traveling from the, heart, the head to the heart. That's where we are. Song of Solomon, chapter 3, verses 1 through 5.
On my bed, night after night, I sought him, whom my soul loves. I sought him, but did not find him. I must arise now and go about the city, in the streets and in the squares. I must seek him, whom my soul loves. I sought him, but did not find him. Verse 3, the watchmen who make the rounds in the city found me, and I said, Have you seen him whom my soul loves? Scarcely had I left them, and when I found him whom my soul loves, I held on to him and would not let him go until I had brought him to my mother's house and into the room of her who conceived me. I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles or by the hens of the field, that you will not arouse or awaken my love until she pleases. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father and our God, we come before the throne of grace this morning. Enlightened, excited, humbled, and truly honored to be invited around the table to have the precious privilege to engage with different aspects of worship, singing and prayers, and giving. And now we come to the Word, the preached Word of God. Father, how high are your thoughts and how low is our attention span? And therefore we beseech you and Holy Spirit that he would seal our minds from distractions and that the word of God would begin to penetrate our hearts and that the word of God would transform us into the likeness of Christ and we may be the people, the aliens, the sojourners, looking to the blessed hope, the blessed inheritance, that those whom have been adopted through the Lord Jesus Christ shall receive. Help us now, Father, to really tune in to this text and to meditate on your word. In Christ's name we pray, amen. I believe that there are three flashes of delight in this text that really demand our pointed attention. But first, we must remember the words that God told Abraham in Genesis 15. God told Abraham something very significant, I believe, for this morning. In 1513 of the book of Genesis, God told Abraham, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs. Referring to the Egyptian captivity, where the Israelites were undergoing bondage. They were going to be strangers in a land that was not theirs. The land of Goshen, if you will. That could maybe be said how you feel this morning. Strangers in a strange land. Not necessarily in a strange land. You're in Peekneyville, Illinois. You're very comfortable and familiar here. But you find yourselves this morning in a strange book. The Song of Solomon. What a strange text might even be safe to say that you've never even heard a sermon out of this book. The Song of Solomon, the author bears his name. Solomon, the son of David, reigned over the United Monarchy for 40 years and then it was divided. 
because of his sin. It is a dramatic love song, really. Uh, parallels and it enhances God's plan for marriage and really including the beauty of sexual intimacy and the marriage fidelity between one man and one woman called the husband and the wife. I was sharing with Alex this book is suffering in a couple different ways that came to my mind. Number one, the one way that it's suffered by Christians is because it's not mentioned in the New Testament ever. It's never quoted by any of the New Testament authors, so therefore a lot of Christians come to the conclusion that it must not be of much value. That's a very dangerous, catastrophic way of thinking because Esther is not quoted in the New Testament. Obadiah is not quoted in the New Testament. And neither is Nahum. But we don't have a problem with those books, do we? The right resolve is 2 Timothy 3.16 where the Apostle Paul says that all Scripture is theos penustes. It is God-breathed and is useful for our correction, for our edification, for our reproof, and for our training in righteousness. This book is just as important as our favorite book, the book of Acts. The second way that it suffered is a lot of Christians only interpret it as allegorical, meaning that it just has a deeper meaning than what it actually is written, claiming that it has no historical basis. That's the liberal position. It's not historical. But then we've got to be careful with the conservative position because we say, well, it has no implications between a husband and a wife. It only reflects Christ and His church. Really? And there's truth to that. And in fact, that's the position I'm going to take today. But before we just go into that position, I have to defend the historical accuracy of the Word of God. And that is the fact that we cannot downplay the fact of frequent poetic use in the Scripture. And this poetic depiction depicts a reality when reality always points to truth. And it is between a husband and a wife. First. Second, it depicts Christ and His relationship to the church. The immediate context is a husband and a wife. In short, if I had to do a precis on this book and sum it up into one sentence, I would call it this. It's spiritual music for a lifetime of marital harmony. Boy, that's ridiculous in a culture that hates marriage today. That is nonsensical to a culture that would mock the sanctity of marriage, a culture that kills the family, a culture that kills babies, and a culture that kills the sanctity of marriage. Why do they kill these things? Because they want to kill God. That's why. Kill God. Therefore, downplay the role of the family. Downplay the role of the sanctity of life. Downplay the role of the sanctity of marriage. The truth is that marriage is the ultimate chief romance, the, the most lovely thing in the entire world. That's why Peter calls this human relation, 1 Peter 3, 7, the grace of life. The grace of life. It's not just for Christians. It's for an entire society. In fact, the society cannot long live or govern or function when that is destroyed. When we meditate upon the Lord, we contemplate His character, His attributes, which is called theology proper the attributes of God. We contemplate that. We, we think about that in our mind. Maybe as we're driving or working in our secular jobs, we constantly are thinking about the character of God. And we come to know then something of His goodness and His kindness and His mercy and His gentleness and His grace and even His wrath. And then under that umbrella, we then reevaluate ourselves. Not as strong but weak individuals, as fallen individuals, as really foolish individuals. 
bad individuals headed for hell. Not utopia, as the young people say today, not even nirvana, as the Buddhists say, or as the Jehovah's Witness say, we're headed for annihilationalism. Just poof, be gone. Well, if that's true, what are we doing here this morning? Let's go live it up. Let's go eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. No, we're headed for hell unless grace intervenes. And we respond to that grace. Now, I can see now, I can see why a such meditation upon God would call us to constrain the beloved or to compel the beloved. You ever think about God and want to just compel Him or constrain Him? The bridegroom, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's our text before us. Look at Song of Solomon, chapter 3, verse 4. I found him. In order to meditate upon the Lord, we really got to go beyond the husband. Maybe even the best husband who gets the, the husband award, if you will. We've got to go beyond him. We've got to contemplate him who our soul loves. We have to contemplate and meditate on Him who our souls admire. And we have to contemplate on Him who our souls truly enjoy. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ, the God-man. And commune with Him. How do you do that? How so? So what? Relevance. Psalm of Solomon, chapter 3, verse 1. Look at the text. I saw him twice in verse 1. I saw him twice in verse 2. Dwayne's Sunday school meditation was by far this morning the best Sunday school message I've ever heard in my entire existence. You don't get that in a lot of other churches, by the way. He was giving you meat. You were getting meat this morning. He was serving a filet mignon on a fine fiesta dish. Did you receive it? Sought him is exclusively linked first to our initial sanctification. Understanding God's part that he sent his son, that he shed his blood, the spirit reveals the word of God. And then there's man's part to hear that, believe that, repent of that, confess that and, and be buried in that. And then we sought him in that sense. A slave of sin has found the chief deliverer. A mere man has found the very Lord of glory. Have you found Him? A, 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 a child of darkness has found the Lord of light. Have you found Him this morning? And then the second part of sought Him is being faithful until death. That's the progressive sanctification that I'm probably guessing he'll get into next week. The second aspect of sanctification. That is those who really love Jesus. That is those men who are going to gird up the loins and take action in the Lord. That's those who will march as soldiers when they exit the pew. Seeking Him with anguish. Seeking Him with an agony and a deep desire. 1 Peter 2.4 Coming to Him. Present tense, Greek imperative. It's a command and it's ongoing. And that's when one can say then that they've truly found Him. When that second aspect occurs. James 4.8, it's drawing near to God and God will draw near to you. 
In order to do this, you have to get beyond denominationalism and you have to get beyond all men. You have to get beyond all creeds and confessions. In order to do this, you have to get beyond all means, if you will. In order to do this, one has to be totally content with Him. I found Him. It's being content with Him. Not content with the pontoon boat, not content with the Xbox, not content with fishing boats or TVs or electronics or soap operas or sports or stuff, but Him. And the one who has found Him will meditate on His person. And that actually must go deeper than just knowing about God. And the one who has found Him is really affected by this. There's some of my family who wanted Josh to get off drugs and alcohol and to find Jesus, but they didn't want him to become affected by it. They wanted Josh as a cute little Christian who would just go to church, but they didn't really want him to be affected because now you're considered a radical. And when you show up for Christmas dinner, ask Rachel, they scatter like flies. Even when your own grandma says, light invades the darkness, doesn't it? Well, if they want to continue and sniff drugs and cocaine, then they're in the dark. Affected. It affects you, man. As Dwayne said, your lifestyle will change. You become affected by this. Scripture speaks, so we speak, and Scripture provides clear, punctual, precise answers of how this affects the Christian. Can you prove it? Sure. My favorite book in the Bible, Daniel. Daniel. Daniel was one who found him in love and in actually fellowshipping with God. What's that look like? I don't know. We could come up with a thousand answers, but I believe the one who has found him will have great energy for God. Number one, great energy for God. And he will be assured of his presence, won't he? Daniel chapter 11, verse 32. By smooth words, he, as some people argue about this he, some people even say that it's the Antichrist. Uh, some people say it's Antiochus Epiphanes. Yeah, I don't think that it really matters. It's subject matter. I don't care at this point. Whoever it is, it's an evil man who has arisen in history. He will turn to godlessness those who act wickedly toward the covenant. With smooth words, he will turn to godlessness those who act wickedly toward the covenant. But the people who know their God will display strength and take action. One of the evidences of one that has found God is they will take action for the Lord. They have great energy for the Lord. In the context here, God is being defied. God is being defelled. God is being diminished. God is trying to be destroyed and disregarded. But the one who has found God has great energy for God. And if he cannot rest, he must feel or she must feel that that individual must do something for God. That's the one who's found God. So what? Well, the dishonor done in God's name actually drives them or moves them or goads them, goes into action. That's the one who's found God, man. They've got great energy for the Lord and it moves them into action. When God is defied and when God is derailed and when God is discouraged and diminished and destroyed, it moves them into action. Question. 
How does the predicament of the lost make you feel this morning? Are you concerned? I asked myself if I was worried that I have unsaved loved ones that are dying and going to hell. Do you? Or do you care? Does it bother you in the USA that millions of babies have been murdered? Look at your children. It's as if someone was ripping your children out of your arms and murdering them. That's who you want to vote for? Does the Lord ever impress your spirit in the night watch? Now, come on, preacher. That's a little bit radical. Josh is on one this morning. No, I'm not, actually. Pray for me. I'm not even feeling it this morning. But does the Lord ever impress your spirit in the night watch? Ever wake you up in the middle of the night? That I'm just totally grieved over this individual or this individual? Or even my own spiritual condition? Daniel found him and, and there was evidence, man. He didn't let a dead dog lie. He had energy for God. He challenged the king's decree. Rather than risk the ritual defilement, defilement of eating the king's Debbie cakes. He didn't do it, man. And then when Darius suspended prayer, guess what they told Daniel? If you pray to God, you're going to die. Think about that. That one in, went in some ears and out the other. They told Daniel, man, if you pray to God, you're going to die and be put to death. Much like the Kung Flu virus or the election infection virus. Everybody's concerned with survival. Just look around. Everybody's concerned with surviving. There is no surviving death. Hebrews 9, 27 says it's been appointed for man to die. And after this comes judgment. Now I realize that we need to be careful and not foolish, but the end of the, at the end of the day, no matter your position, the church does not exist to save people from the flu. The church exists only to save people from an eternal hell. And we're stewards, man, of the only message that can rescue lost men and women, and they're wanting to shut us down. Daniel was promised the death penalty if you pray. Guess what Daniel did? He went on praying. Daniel went on, man. He did it three times a day, and he opened the windows so everybody could see it. One who knows God and has found God, man, has a great zeal for God and a zeal for the glory of God and it's only found in those who know their God. And they are the ones that are going to be very sensitive to situations in which God's truth and God's honor is under attack. And whenever they want to tactically jeopardize our religious freedoms, it's then that the people of God stand up and say, it ain't happening, man. Rather than let the matter go by default, the people of God will seek to compel a change of heart, even at the state of personal risk. And that's what Daniel did. They told him, if you do this, you're going to die. Daniel said, I'm going to do it anyways. The second evidence of those who have found God have great high thoughts of God. And Daniel understood that too. How do you know that? Daniel 4.26 Daniel came to a realization Heaven rules over history. Daniel understood the wisdom of God, the truth of God, the mind of God, the sovereignty of God, the mercifulness of God, that God is the ultimate judge and that heaven rules. 
His third evidence is a boldness for God, the fiery furnace in Daniel 3. Rachel sent me a picture yesterday when we were in the car and it had this buffed up dog. Okay, it was like a wolf dog, man, and he had big muscles and it said the first century church. And then over here was a fat, lazy dog sitting down with his tongue out and it said the church of 2020. Don't want to offend anybody. The first century church man was macho man. The fourth evidence is they are ones that have great contentment in God. Remember the response in the furnace in Daniel 3, 16 and 18? We don't need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. Daniel's saying, hey, we're content with God here. No panic. No panicking. If we're thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it. And He will rescue us from your hand, O King Nebuchadnezzar. What is He saying there? Let's be courteous to the King. Okay? But, but unanswerable here, they knew their God. But even if He does not, they said, if no deliverance at all comes, man, then O King, we want you to know something. That we are going to die. But we're going to die not serving your God. How could someone say that when they're truly found God? And when they are truly content in God? That's the essence of finding God. i got to move on. We could go all day with that. But notice what else is said in the Song of Solomon chapter 3 verse 4. I held on to Him. I found Him. And then next she said, I held on to Him. Mm -hmm. and the Lord is our <coughs> possession. He's mine, yours. He's the heart's resolve. Maybe we've determined in our hearts never to lose Him again. Maybe you've backslidden from the Lord and have come to Him and walked over broken glass in your repentance and and maybe, man, we're resolved to get more serious about the Lord, man. Because it's a slow fade when we begin to fall away as Jeremy Camp's song. It's a slow fade, man. A lot of truth to that. Maybe we're resolved never to lose Him again. I don't care how serious Josh is or, or how stupid he is or whatever. Seriousness. Praying and pleading with Him never to withdraw. Well, now, preacher, He doesn't withdraw. We do. Yes, that's true. But we still plead with Him. 2011, when I became a Christian, I didn't know how to pray. I wanted to pray. And I really struggled with that. How do we pray? And everybody was giving me great big grand old theological answers and it went straight over my head. I didn't know. Get practical. I need the cookies brought on the bottom shelf. I don't understand. Can you just explain to me a simple way to pray? The only thing I could muster out of my lips because of this radical change that had taken place is this. Lord, please keep me close to you. Lord, please keep me close to you today. I'm surrounded working in this factory by people that have just ungodly talk, just like I used to, talking about all kinds of immorality. And the only thing that I can muster in my prayer is, God, please keep me close to you. I didn't know how to pray. That's all I knew how to say. But really, now I can say through the study of the Word, Boy, did I know how to pray in those days. Every bird sings good in the cage. I really did know how to pray. That was very theological, and I didn't even know it. See, the problem was I was comparing my prayers to that which I had heard in the Lord's Day in the meeting house, and they were just very beautiful and fluent and traditional and the same things over and over and over again. I thought that's how you pray, but there was never any intimacy in the prayer. Like, God, I want to stay close to you today. 
That's radical. Holding on to him. <laughs> the restoration movement, raccoon John Smith, at Decane Ridge Revival in Kentucky, was surrounded by Calvinists who believed once saved, always saved. And the raccoon John Smith climbed the tree and was hanging from the tree branch at that revival meeting in the open air field. And he was hanging like a wild monkey from the tree branch. And he yelled at the Calvinist as he's hanging there and says, what happens if I let go? And they wouldn't answer him. Well, beloved, if you didn't know the forces of gravity, when you let go, you fall. Holding on to him is, is the chief essence of loving him. Hungering for the Word of God. Hungering for Him more and more and more. Making Him my all. I mean, really, man, the Lord's only going to stay where He's prized. Hold on to Him by renouncing all other loves, all other sins, all other idols. 1 John 5, 21. A little children... Guard yourselves from idols. There's religious idolatry. Hinduism has three million different gods. Feminism. Horoscopes. China fortune cookies. Ridiculousness. Allah. Or now the Star Wars god called the Force. The Force be with you. That's pantheism. Anton LaVey, the founder of the Church of Satan in San Francisco. Secular idolatry is a little bit more subtle. And Jesus points that out in Matthew 6.24. Wealth or greed or stuff can be our God. God is a jealous God. In order to hold on to Him, we have to get rid of idols. But also, it's hard to hold on to God when we're sleepy. Sleepy saint really is an anomaly. There's really no such thing. The true Christian is supposed to be awakened from sleep unto life. Reality is, though, is when we're not on guard, sleepiness creeps in. Drowsiness, spiritual drowsiness. <clears throat> it's hard to hold on to something when you're tired. Just look at a baby, maybe holding on to her bottle, and then she falls asleep in her mom's lap. What's the first thing that happens? The indicator that you're asleep. My father-in-law told her, was it Alan? Forgive me. Sure, you're my father too. Well, no, there's Jesus, the only father. Okay, all right, forget it. You're my brother. I love you like a father. If I had a dad like you, I probably wouldn't have went down the road that I went in in my life. Alan told the story one time, I think, of a man at the coal mine who fell asleep on his lunch break and he would hold his keys. Was that you? And his alarm clock, when he woke up to get back to work, was he would hear his keys fall on the ground. See, you think I don't listen. Just kidding, bro. You can't hold on to nothing, man, when you're sleeping. It's hard to hold on when you're sleeping. Characteristics of sleep. The body, key word, body, is asleep. It's in a state of inactivity at that point. The body members are relaxed. Everything's just calm and no, don't get all worked up. It's less tense. It's slack. It's in a state of unconsciousness. And when the body is asleep, the mind is suspended, isn't it? Oh yeah, there, there may be a mental ascent. That's true. Good sermon. But holiness and practical godliness is ignored. It's a slumbering hope. And when there's a slumbering hope, there is no meditating upon the fact that one is adopted, one is an heir into the family of God, that the inheritance is coming, that the casket is coming, that the, the wealth of the Father is at hand. 
that there's an entire estate laid up for the Christian. A lazy love for God, then there's no living for the glory of God. When the love of Christ seeks and ceases to constrain, to self-denial and following the example that the Lord has left for us, the soul is asleep. And when that happens, all we bring to church is our bodies and not our soul. And then all you have is a crowd and not the church. And there's a big difference between the crowd and the church. The problem is the heart. Backsliding begins in the heart. And I'm going to kick it up a notch and say something that you've probably never even heard before. But I'm telling you and I'm warning you now, don't even fellowship with these type of Christians. Don't do it. Here's my rebuttal on that. Because if you get too close, it will produce lethargy even within your own self. That's the problem with the wise virgins and intimacy with these graceless professors of God. They were too close in fellowship with the foolish ones. Paul gives a warning in 1 Corinthians 15, 33 and 34. Paul says, do not be deceived. Why did he say, do not be deceived? Because he says, evil companionship corrupts good morals. The Greek word, the verb there, literally means commune. You want to commune with these types of people? I mean, man, we ought to know from, from the China virus... And Kung Flu, we ought to know from Kung Flu that the disease passes. And a disease is more apt to pass on an individual rather than your good health. The conversations of the wicked have more power to corrupt than a good conversation will stir you on to virtue. It ain't going to happen. Gossip is the is the key definer here. And it's really not even the openly profane or the drug addicts or the atheists with their careless talk that is the greatest menace of the Christian walk. But the greatest menace of the Christian walk is those who have a form of godliness but deny that power by the speech that comes out of their mouth or the lack of things that they do say. Turn away from them. Paul says it will spread like man green. We hold on to him by active faith. Song of Solomon 2.7 Awaken my love. The appeal is if you have Jesus, one will hold on to him. And he is willing to be constrained. You say how? I say during his life the disciples constrained him. You remember at the Last Supper when young John was there and he leaned his head onto the bosom of Jesus, he heard the heartbeat of God. How do you constrain the Lord? Well, that's not very manly. Oh, but it is. They always ask him, Lord, where did you go? Where did you go? Number three, Song of Solomon 3, 4. She said, I brought him. I found him, I held on to him, and I brought him. The bride is dreaming in this context, though, of the wedding. And her expectations in those five verses are just escalating for the wedding. It's growing more intense for the wedding. And then after she finds him and holds on to him, verse 4 says she brought him to her mother's house. Relevance, what's that mean? It means that she brought him to where she resides, man. She brought him to her daily life and to her daily activity. That'll preach. It doesn't imply premarital sex because look at verse 5 of the next verse, chapter 3, verse 5. The text says this. I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles or by the hens of the field, that you will not arouse or awaken my love until she pleases. Relevance. 
The beloved bride knows the intensity of her love for Solomon, man, and she knows that she cannot experience sexual intimacy until the wedding. And therefore, she invites the daughters of Jerusalem to come and to help hold her accountable in this regarding sexual purity. Up to this point, though, man, there, has, there was this escalating desire within her. Yeah, all that was expressed in her language. Okay, Josh, application. Well, how many of us claim to be married to Christ, reunited with Christ, and bring Him nowhere? Our homes. We don't even have God in our homes. If flagrant, willful sin can just go on under the roof of our homes, then God is not in our homes. Why do you think they're after to destroy our privacy and to destroy the family? So they can get into the home. If Satan can get into the home through the one-eyed monster of what our kids are watching on the screens, or what we're watching, if we're sitting there watching filth and soap operas, then I bet if we knew Jesus was coming back, we would turn it off. What about on the iPad or our cell phones? Or what do we do in our jobs? Do we bring Jesus to our jobs? And as we learned Wednesday night in Bible study, in 1 Samuel, that the glory has departed. Ichabod, the glory has departed, man. And the number one indicator of the autopsy of a deceased church, if you can be comfortable in your sin, you're lost. You're the prodigal son. Repent. But the number one autopsy of a deceased church is the Great Commission, he said, becomes the Great Omission. We're keepers of the aquarium rather than fishers of men. And that's when, instead of going out and actually fishing for men, we try to steal fish from other bowls. And that's called theft. Matthew 28, 19 through 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything that I have commanded you. And Jesus said, here you go. Remember, I'm with you always to the end of the age. Brought him. He's with us when we do that. He's not with us when we just do church. That's the Great Commission, man. Two points. They are to go, and they are to depend upon the power of Jesus. There it is. And that's when he said, I'm with you. Tom Rader says that in reality, though, for most churches, they talk about growth. But he said, quote, dying churches really didn't want growth unless the growth met their preferences and allowed them to remain comfortable. Close quote. The truth is, the comfortable Christian, beloved, doesn't bring Jesus anywhere except for the auditorium. And when the comfortable Christian brings Jesus only to the auditorium, then it becomes the light show. The universal church will never die. Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18, On this rock I will build my church. The forces of Hades will not overpower it. But as we hit the runway here this morning, those apart from the true, those apart of the true church will labor to promote communion with Christ, fellowship with Christ, turning from sin, coming to Christ, the cross. Everyone's going to die. Amos 4:12, prepare to meet your God, O Israel. Can meet him in grace here and now, or you can meet him in judgment then and there. Wherever we go, we bring God with us. How do you do it? Thoughts, words, and deeds. Garbage in, garbage out. Truth in, 
holiness out. We bring him and we evangelize because it's the message people must hear. That's what the church needs. Not really new. And buildings are nice, but it's a tool. But if our main focus is the building, and if our main focus is uh, my salary, or I don't know, benevolent works, carrying groceries to the car, or running a food pantry, if that's our main focus, we, these are all good things. But if that's our main focus, we've lost the central mission of Jesus because the central mission of Jesus was to seek and to save the lost. The church needs Christ in their midst and how do you know that he's likely to come when he's brought? How's it going to be done when we hold on to him? Who alone can do it? Those who have found him and the evidence that those who found him love him and meditate and seek on Him, are you amongst that number? I got more I could go on, but I'm going to land the plane. That's how you become amongst that number. Seeking Him, finding Him, bringing Him, all has to do with being faithful. Let's pray. Father, we love the Word of God. We're so thankful for the Word. We're so thankful for the beautiful poetry we've been able to look at this morning. The inspired poet. We're thankful for the sanctity marriage, which is not instituted to make us happy. It's not a partnership of her money and his money. It's your means, just like the Word of God, to sanctify us. That's why there is no compatibility. Two different men and women, women seeking to be sanctified and pressed and molded and conformed to the image of Christ for your sovereign purpose and glory to produce in us the character of Christ. But we're thankful for our ultimate bride, groom. You, Lord, to be a part and to look forward with hope to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Father, we thank you and we ask and pray that you would take these truths to heart this morning. In Christ's name.